Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherston Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, one of my very best friends, actress Christina Elmore, comes on, and we're talking about being genuine, being authentically and unapologetically you, and letting the cards fall where they may. There's a lot of pressure on us Black and brown women to be somebody to everybody, and that's just exhausting and honestly completely depleting. Many, many years ago, I struggled with seasonal depression. I wasn't a depressed person, but I was in a depressed season. I remember retreating, not wanting to attend events, hang with friends, pick up the phone, text back. It was bad. My close friends noticed and asked repeatedly if I was okay, and I, of course, answered yes, because I was afraid of letting them down by admitting that I actually wasn't okay. I thought faking it would be easier. Finally, they had a talk with me, one of those, girl, listen, we know you and we know something is up talks. And that allowed me to finally open up. We all need friends like this. Friends that see you even when you want to crawl into bed and hide. Christina is absolutely one of those friends for me and is truly one of the most genuine people I know. Yet she also has to fight the pressure to be somebody to everybody and the very human need to be liked. For her, being a mom has helped, But going back to HBO's Insecure just six weeks after giving birth took this struggle to the next level. So, like, I say to other people, I'm like, oh, how great that, like, I got to bring my saggy boobs and my, you know, hanging belly to work. And it was perfectly appropriate for the character. But also, I think that we don't see that on TV normally. And in our Sankofa moment, Christina tells us about a lesser-known historical figure who had nerve. I was so surprised I didn't know about until college because it's the kind of story that you should be teaching elementary school students about and they should be doing projects around because it's not just that this man um, was a great figure of Black history, but he did something so innovative and cool and courageous. Hi, sister. Hello, my love. <sighs> You're just a breath of fresh air. Oh, my gosh. I mean, <laughs> I can't believe that I get to do this here with you. I know. And in person. I know. It's so great. I was like kind of adamant about that, which no. you probably are like, Christina, it why are we? kind of. It was very. I was like, no, I'm going to do it <laughs> with her. I get an email. They're like, we're getting a request <laughs> that um, Christina would like to do it in person. And I was I was thinking, yes, she wants to do it in her office. So yes, the office at my home, Christina has decided, is also her office. I mean, but is it not? It is, but why is it I've your spent, office at your house, my office too? Well, I don't know. It could be, but I've spent more. You don't want the children in the background. The reason yeah. I come here, I have a beautiful office. I love it. It's great. It's um, gorgeous. Love it. It's, it's <laughs> a blessing. Except for that my children are allowed. I made a mistake and it's on my floor. It's on the first floor. Next to where my kids play. What was I thinking? Yeah. And so yeah. I do use my my ABFJ office to do my long days of Zoom. Yes. Christina comes to our house to do work and meetings and press and all the things she sees a famous TV star. It's yeah, fine. Before we get into how we met, mm-hmm. which is a cool story. I feel like we have different versions of how we met. Oh, I can't wait. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's my favorite. Okay. First, I'm just curious, what songs have you been listening to on repeat? Ooh, you know what? Okay, you know me. I don't, I'm not going to say this on a podcast. I don't be listening to that much music. But you do. No, I listen to the same things over and over. That's true. But yeah. I mostly am listening to like an audiobook, a okay. podcast. Okay, so what are, you, what are you listening to? Okay, so right now I'm listening. Oh, so like, oh my gosh. Okay, I just finished the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. It is a novel. It yes. is incredible. It's 800 pages and worth every drop. Woo. It goes from like 1725 to 2015, I think. And it, it tracks a family in what becomes the American South. And it, it has an indigenous component of the family and then black people who were enslaved and then Ooh. all of the generations and the white people who enslaved them and how that family gets all mixed up and it's incredible and beautiful and I didn't want it to end even though it was 29 hours of audio. I was going to say, how <laughs> long did it take you? It's, but you know what? I listened to it in like a week or maybe a week and a half. 
the t- all 29 hours. A question, when, when are you, where, where are these hours that's in your why day? I have that's to what I need to That's know. why it has to be audiobooks because I'm listening like while I'm cleaning the bathroom. Okay, so also you all should know that Christina's sons are my godsons. Yes. So I love them. They're my little baby boys. So I want to start with California. Mm-hmm. You've lived many places <laughs> in California, mm-hmm. but I want you to tell me what California has given you. Hmm. You know, I've never, ever once in my life been asked that or thought about that because you're right. I grew up all over California. So I was born in Los Angeles and lived here until I was 14. And then we lived in San Diego for like a part of Los Angeles. Um, so South LA specifically, and then we moved to mid city when I was around nine or 10, nine. Fancy schmancy. Yes. Yeah, so we moved on up a little bit. <laughs> we, we did. We had a little, you know, I grew up, I feel like I grew up and my parents sort of glowed up. So I, yeah, right. I have lived up and down and then I was in grad school in the Bay area and now back in LA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know, took a little time off to go to Harvard. Um, see ya. Jet on over to Massachusetts. I did do a, a, just a four year stint. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. Like, first of all, can we just get into that? I think sometimes because you're just the most humble, sweet, kind person I know. Like, you're a Harvard graduate, Christina. Like, you're just <laughs> but, walking around. No, but that's a thing. Like, that is a very prestigious university. Mm-hmm. It is a university for a long time. Folks like you and me, we couldn't even go there. They, definitely weren't well ushering us in. And so I do think it's really beautiful. I won't say it's unique because there's a a billion now, not a billion, but there's a ton of amazing uh, black and brown Harvard, I was going to say Howard. (laughs) Ew. (laughs) Ew, ew, ew. Harvard graduates now. But I do think, like, I am curious, why did you go to Harvard? You know, so I applied. My dad told me, so back to California, my dad told me, if you go to college in California, I'm not going to pay for it. I think, and and this is like the opposite of what most parents, they're like, please stay close. Switch it in my brain. I'm like, wait. Yes. Most parents are like, please stay. stay." My dad was like, no, you need, I think because he has a unique journey of like, he left his home in Kentucky when he was 16 and then went to New York and then lived in Paris and was an actor and a dancer all before becoming a pastor and psychologist. So like, He's had a whole journey. And I think he recognized the value in getting out and getting further out from where you're from and leaving your safety bubble. And so he told me, he was like, yeah, I won't pay for college in California. So I didn't apply to any schools in California. And I was a pretty good student. So it didn't, it made sense that I had IVs on my list. Um, So I applied to several. And so then I got into all of the schools I applied for except for Yale. Yeah. Man. Um, did you want to go to the drama school? I did. And then I applied when I applied for graduate schools, yeah. I got into all the graduate schools I applied to except for Yale. Oh, I have questions, the L Y. What did I do? Yale, what's up? But you know what? Look, one day randomly in a couple of years, Yale's gonna be like, Christina, we would love to invite you to mm-hmm. that's how it always mm-hmm. goes. That is story. and I'm gonna be like, No, no, I'm not. No. Yale, You're please perfect. call me. <laughs> Yeah, Christina would love to still come. It's still a dream of her. But when I got into Harvard, um, I was like, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to Barnard. And I think I was a school counselor that was like, well, you just, if they, if you can afford it, if they're giving you the money that you need, you just, why would you say no to that? And I, I couldn't think of a good reason to say no. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Well, I'm realizing we skip, well, I skipped how we met. Oh. So what's your story? How we well, met? Okay, I feel like, Honestly, my story is just, I let you tell the story because I don't, every time you ever say it, every time you ever say how we met, I'm always like, is that how? I feel like there's some other component. I want you to- Okay, so, okay, so I'm going to say what I remember as the first time we met. I I think it was uh, 2012 or 2011. No, 13. Okay. Oh, so now now you got detail. Well, I do know that detail because I met, <laughs> in, I moved back to LA in 2012. Okay. So it must have been yeah. 2013. Okay. So we were at our friend Nia's house yes. for a watch party 
for Yanni's episode of Mad Men. Yes. Our friend Yanni King Monshine was on, uh, she was guest starring on Mad Men. Yes, brilliant. So great. And she uh, invited us all over to our friend Nia Gervier's house to do a watch party. Now, I I knew a lot of the people there, but there were some people, you know, yeah. she was bringing together. Yeah, yeah. And you were one of those people. I think maybe we had some sort of banter and then we sat down next to each other on the floor yes. watching Yanni's episode. We just connected. I don't even remember. I don't know if we had a, if we talked about anything specific. I just think we just met. You were, it was literally like, we just knew God sent us for yeah. one another. And literally since that day, we've been friends ever since. See, that's the part. Okay, so all of what you're saying Yes, but because I think you're saying we just connected, I feel like there had to be some extra, because we connected so strong and then later became best friends, business partners, God, yes. family. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm like, is there a step that we met? Like, how did we do that? I usually can't go to a thing and actually truly connect with someone um, without another, a, a, t- a time where it's more just one-on-one or or we had some big bonding experience or something like that. I I, there are people who we both know, who I've known for years, but we're not close friends because I, it's very rare that I take it from like chit chat, small chat, we meet at events to like really being in each other's lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think the fact that that happened with you and I Mm -hmm. at like a casual watch party for our friend's show, I'm always like, what was the other thing though? (laughs) But there was no other thing. There was just no other thing. There's just a bond. It literally was just an instantaneous bond. And I, and I, truly believe that like God literally we were made for each other yeah. especially like w- at the time that we met so when we met we were what 20 25 oh, 24 25, 25. yeah 20 well I was probably 24 and you were probably 20 Ashley is an entire <laughs> what seven months younger than me eight months younger than me and makes it seem like she's just some spring chicken yeah um so yeah we were young we were very young and we've been through it all together. And But with you talking about college and the just esteemed universities that you applied to, I'm realizing even though we've been besties for 10 years, you have always had like um, a strong sense, I think, of who you are and what you want, but also like you're excellent. You're just excellent in every area of your life and you strive for excellence, only only someone who wants to be excellent in, in every way wants to go to one of those types of universities. And so I want to know how much of that do you get from your parents? I think that's a good question. I think what I love and I'm so grateful for about my parents is that they didn't require that of me um, or of my siblings. They didn't, they didn't, you know, there's some families who are like, no, in this family, we do black excellence and we, you will do this. My dad would give us money for our grades. Like we would get, if you got straight A's, you could get $50. Whoa. Yeah, no, it was. And then for every A, you get like $5. And for every B, you get like $3. Something, I don't remember what it was. Yes. But, it, but it would like catapult if you got straight A's. You get catapult. 50. And so my parents weren't like, everyone needs to get straight A's. They were just like, but if you happen to, here's this $50. And if you got a C, we didn't get in trouble. You, it was just be like, you didn't get that money. And so I remember once I... I just have always been kind of like the way that sort of U.S. Western formalized school, it just worked for my brain. It happened to. I don't think that it made me, I was any smarter than anybody else. I just happened to thrive in the sit down at this desk, hear what I have to say and do these worksheets kind of way. My brain just responded to that. And so I happened to be good at school, but I also am a kind of person, I think being a middle child, I'm a people pleaser. You know this about me. I don't want anybody mad at me. I don't want anybody to think cross of me. I don't want anybody. And so I think for those sort of selfish reasons, I tried to do well so that no one would have any reason to ever think anything but great about me. Um, And that's for better or for worse. And it didn't come from my parents requiring it, but I do think that I knew it could please them. But I also knew deep down that they'd be proud of me no matter what. And I remember once I got a B, or I I thought I was going to get a B, and I was like, oh, daddy, I'm not going to get the straight A's. He was like, I was like, I think I'm going to work a little harder than this guy. He was like, well, why are you going to work harder? What's wrong with the B? And I remember being like, what? I think that was in eighth grade. And we were taking a walk, walking our dog. And I can remember it so clearly. He was like, well, what's wrong with the B? He was like, and I thought about that later. And I was like, there's really nothing wrong with the B. And for me, in my head, in my spirit, though, that B was ruinous. Like, wow. I couldn't imagine just being okay with a B. I, I was like, well, 
I could get it, but I'm not going to be okay with it. Mm. He was like, but why? Um, and so I think that drive to do things well, it, it's double-sided. It comes from just wanting everyone to be on Team Christina. And then also, though, you know, I'm a planner. We're both this way. Like, yeah. we like to know what we're going to do next and then put it on the calendar and do it. And yeah. And so I think that helps with achieving. But ultimately, I kind of wish I was a little less that way. Yeah, because as you're talking, I'm like, oh, I see how this is motivating in a lot of ways as a young adult. Mm-hmm can be quite damaging as an adult, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially as artists, where oftentimes, you know, we're we're in this industry where like, at least at some point during the week, someone quote unquote, isn't team Christina or isn't team (laughs) Ashley. Right. And so I'm curious about how you're reconciling that. It's really... I don't have the thing where I'm afraid of rejection. Somehow it doesn't manifest that way for me. So like I don't, you know, not get the role and think, oh God, woe is me. They don't like me. Somehow I've been able to, after all these years, realize, oh, it really had nothing to do with me. (laughs) You're not getting the But I do still have that feeling of like about with interpersonal relationships and like that, oh, I have to be this kind of friend so that they will like me rather than letting it be motivated by just my genuine love and care, sometimes it can get in the way of my own good intentions because I end up doing things in a way that I want to be performatively great and performatively kind and loving rather than being genuinely, authentically loving and kind. And that's a hard line to toe. And then I do think parenting is helping me reconcile it, though, on a day-to-day, honestly, Mm. because my kids are not always team mommy. (laughs) Like... Mm. I have to keep limits and set boundaries and say no to things that make it so that in that moment, my little one-year-old runs away crying and my five-year-old has an attitude and he's like, ugh, mommy. And I think that has helped me a lot, though, because I still know that what I'm doing is for their benefit. I know that it's instructive and I know that they need it, um, even though it doesn't please them. And that helps me. It learned to do that with other adults, too. Wow. It can be right without being um, pleasing or without being what they want. Even it can still be the right thing to do. Okay. So when you are in a situation with another person that, you know, you know, the situations that are stressful and you have the knots in your stomach and you feel misunderstood and someone doesn't get it or they're not understanding, you know, your true intentions what do you do with that? Like, how do you, how do you get through that? Yeah. Honestly, Jesus, mm-hmm. <laughs> I remind myself of what he says I am, mm. who he calls me, that he said I'm his daughter, that he said I have an inheritance that I, and it's hard. <laughs> and you, and you know, I just went through something like this recently yeah. and where someone was not pleased with the decision that I needed to make. Um, And I didn't think the decision was wrong, but I still was really sad that they didn't understand it in the way that I did. And and you saw me for days. I was like, I was torn up. Many a time, yeah, Yeah, girl. And I and I just I was sad, and I couldn't sleep, and I'm sending people flowers, and (laughs) I'm trying to write emails in just the exact way to say so that they know that I do love them. I just have to make this other choice and. And um, and then I go back to realizing that some of it is truly selfishness, that the idea that everyone needs to like me or be happy with me um, is just a form of narcissism. And it's like, yes. that's the real tea. Ooh, that's good. Christina. And I'm like, do I want to be liked or, or do I want to just do the right thing and do what is best? And so, and a lot of times I want to be liked and I have to reconcile that that is trash. (laughs) Yeah, it's trash. It is trash. And I'm happy we're talking about it because I think what's more important than being liked is just being authentically you. Yes. And if people like you, great. If they don't, great. But ultimately in the end, we suffer if we're trying to be an adjusted version of Mm -hmm. ourselves just to please someone else. Yeah. And especially when the thing, there's one thing to be 
if, if, if I was being unkind, rude, mean, nasty, that's a whole separate thing. But when you know that being your authentic self is still walking into the world with grace and love and yeah. best intentions, that's it. Yeah, I think, you know, we also have this in common, which is maybe why we're also so close. We have that quality within us where people are like, they can't really be that nice. Yeah. They can't really be that generous or loving or ground or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like, you know, especially growing up, that was something I had to really combat. It would be people would get to know me and then later they would be like, I thought you were so fake because I didn't realize that. But now that I know you, like, this is really who you are. And that is the thing about me. And I know this is the thing about you. Like, I am who I am. Like, you're not going to meet me today and then meet me a year later and be like, whoa, she's completely different. (laughs) How have you dealt with that? Is that tough to deal with, too? I think part of it, I think (laughs) I, um, because I think you and I are very similar in that, but we're also different in that. You, when you go, like I talked about, when I go into a room, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of there as quick as possible. <laughs> I'm going to chat with who I need to talk to, but I'm really trying to leave. You are a connector. So you are a person who is genuinely, like, all of those sweet, wonderful things that you are, and also genuinely interested in connecting with the people in that room <laughs> and wanting to know them. And so that's why, for me, I'm like, how could you not know that Ashley wasn't being her authentic self? But I think people can look at that and be like, How can she be friends with everybody? And how can she be that kind to everybody? And that generous, because you have so many people who call you best friend. You have so many people who call you like deep, deep relationships, have deep, deep relationships with you. And I think people can misunderstand how you could have the capacity for that. And I think they, they misunderstand how I can be bubbly or how I can be like sweet or, you know, generous, but they, they don't, Think that I'm trying to hang out all the time. You know what's interesting that's happening? We haven't even talked about this. I mean, so this is what's kind of cool about this episode is that Christina and I talk about everything, but there's going to be some things that we just haven't even gotten to talk about. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about it here on the, okay, <laughs> on the yeah, podcast. Right. But I think that with me, there's been something interesting going on where, to your point, I think that's also kind of weeding out friendships too. Mm-hmm. Like the the people in my life who may be don't value deep connection in that way or don't want to have vulnerable friendships, um, that makes it hard for them to be friends with me, I think, yeah. because I'm not I'm not surface in any area of my life. And so I think that it it makes me retreat a little bit if people are like kind of cagey. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes other people retreat with me if if they like being cagey and they know that I'm not. Yeah. So it's kind of like it it it, it it makes this natural separation. And that's kind of been difficult for me. I think I've been, you know, noticing it and being like, okay, like, again, it just isn't for everybody. Do you find that as you get older, that's, is it becoming more okay with you that it's more of a weeding process? 1000%. Whereas when you were younger, I would have like, literally wanted to run into oncoming traffic. Mm -hmm. If it felt like a friendship was dissipating or changing. Mm. So you're a woman who I consider to be very intentional. Um, Even like, I just keep going back to this like intentionality with like these colleges. What are your thoughts surrounding how to be very intentional, but also leaving space for the unknown? Yeah. And how do you navigate that? I think, so (laughs) I always talk about how, like, like with college and with graduate school, I had like a 10 year plan from like, I don't know, my junior year in high school to my, to like the end of graduate what school. What was the plan? Well, here was the plan. And I did the plan. I did the plan. The plan was high school, then go to a liberal arts college so that I could explore other sides of my brain, but also still be doing lots of theater and lots of plays and all the drama classes. Um, I would study abroad. I would learn Spanish. Then I would, in my final year of college, apply to graduate school. Yes, I know. Are you fluent in At Spanish? At one point I was. And... That was my plan. I didn't do every bit of it. But I did think, okay, so I'll go to college. Then I would go to graduate school immediately after college where I'd go to a more conservatory program where I'd focus only on acting. I would get my MFA. I would move to Los Angeles or New York. I would immediately begin doing high-profile, amazing plays at regional theaters throughout this country. And then somehow I'd be able to transition that to a television and film career, I would then win Emmys and Oscars, Tonys, and... <laughs> oh, and now she has a different <laughs> accent. 
yes. while she's saying the plan. Well, the plan was just so <laughs> specific. But no, really, I had this plan and I did it for so long. I it's because what's nice about that plan is as you're applying to schools, you can kind of follow it. Like you can do that plan. I'm sitting here so confused. No, listen, I could go to college. Then I could go to graduate school. I could study abroad. There was nothing stopping me from any of those things. What I didn't realize is that the plan kind of runs out after grad school's over. Because then after that, it's a whole bunch of unknowns. Like you, uh, you apply, you go to, you apply to college, you get into somewhere. Yeah. You go to do these auditions, you might not book nothing. Yeah, but what I'm hearing though is, the plan is still rolling. No, the plan rolled, 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 and now it's over, and there's no way to have another plan. I picked a career that you can't build plans in. So had I become a lawyer, I would have gone to law school. I would have hoped to work at a firm. I then would have been, um, you know, a junior colleague, hoped to become a junior yeah, yeah, partner. Yeah. Then from there, maybe become a partner, and then from yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and get bigger and bigger cases, and and always have a solid income, always have yes. health insurance, always know where my next check was coming, buy the house, have the kids, Bang, bang, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think about how acting and how pursuing a career in this industry makes it so your plans are fully null and void. So my plan worked all the way until I got to L.A. And then I was like, oh, shoot, what happens next? There's no school. There's no person telling me exactly where to be, uh-huh. what all hours of the day. Uh-huh. I have no idea if I'm going to book any of these things I'm auditioning for. Mm-hmm. I don't have any more control over what jobs I get. I don't even really have control over what jobs up until now I auditioned for. Mm. So the plan fell apart. And so all of my ideas of intentionality, I had to stop applying to my career and to this plan of education and apply to just my life in general. So I think that is where I decided to have kids in a, at an age when the rest of the country that is old. So wait, wait, before you, before you get into that and the intentionality of motherhood and marriage, I want to talk about that. The reason why I was saying I'm sitting here confused Mm -hmm. is because to me, the plan did not run out. What? And here's why. Everything you said, so you said, okay, and then after college, I wanted to, you know, transition into film and television and then win Emmys and Oscars and Townies, all of these things. You transitioned into film and television and are fully, fully working in those spaces. You haven't been nominated for an Emmy yet, but you were just nominated for an NAACP Image Award. So for me, there's something, the the beauty in what you said is that although you're able to let it go more and, and allow for the uncertainty, you still had a map. And you mm-hmm. still laid some groundwork. Yeah. It's the foundation still of everything that's still happening. It was still a dream that came true and is continuing to like bloom and blossom. But it's not, it didn't run out. It just, the road got a little bit longer and there's different things on it. But girl, you, li- I just got chills. You're literally doing everything. And you know what, Ashley? I don't know. You know, I was I was really adamant about doing this in person, and this is why because Ashley, you always speak a word, girl. I truly, until this moment, I was like, oh yeah, that plan ran out, and That's now insane. I'm doing this other thing that is no plan. No, but sis. you know, no. I'm gonna receive that. I'm just gonna say yes and amen. Okay, so let's get into the babies Ooh. because obviously we were friends pre children. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. now. Friends still, uh, now that you have two young ones. And so let's chat Mm -hmm. about the fourth trimester. Oh, nobody wants to chat about the fourth trimester. Nobody wants to chat about it. And that's why we're going to get into it. Yeah. I want to chat about the fourth trimester for both of your sons Mm -hmm. and how they were different. So the pregnancies so the first three trimesters were very different from for for each pregnancy so silas's you were there i was sick yes. um the entire time so crazy i was vomiting you know day to night it was it was <laughs> it was tough to until see, the baby yeah. came out and then that fourth tri- i thought oh i just need to get the baby out and then it'll be better mm. and yes um, I was no longer nauseous, but everything else was wrong. Yeah. Silas came out. What a joy. What a gift. After a hard labor. Um, 
and he was born and that was a blessing and what a what a delightful child but also what a screamer um and what a plummet of hormones that i didn't realize was going to happen so while you're pregnant your body is just you have more hormones raging than you ever have in your life and then for that to suddenly tank it can lead you to i don't think i had postpartum depression but there's a survey you fill out um I, for me it was the last my last appointment with my midwife. And so my baby was six weeks old and there's, I think up to number nine. And if you get nine, you, they think that you need to see a clinician. You mm -hmm. probably have postpartum depression. And I think I had like eight. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't quite there. It was baby blues, you might say. Um, but there is really sort of a physical plummeting of hormones that leads you to have a mental decline. Um, and then plus, you have this new life you're trying to take care of. You're anxious. You're tired. You're not sleeping. And it seems like there's no, I read so many books while I was pregnant about labor and about delivery and about taking care of your body while you're pregnant and what to eat and what to do and how to hike and take the yoga. And I didn't, I don't know if there, I just didn't find them. No one mentioned, maybe you should read some books about what to happen after that baby's going to get here. And I I felt so, even surrounded by friends like you, surrounded by a wonderful husband and partner and my mom, I still felt so isolated and alone in it. I felt like no one knows what's going on in this room with me and this person who keeps looking at me and wanting something for my body and screaming. And those first few months were devastatingly difficult, but also filled with joy, also filled with like this new life that was so wonderful and this squishy little baby that I, I love more than anything in life. And I don't think I'd ever experienced such a duality, like where I was at both ends of the extreme. And I think that's also part of how exhausting it can be is because you are the happiest, like most joyful, having the most joyful experience of your life at the same time where you're having the hardest adjustment of my life ever. That transition from becoming not being not a mom to a mom is the hardest thing I've ever done, um, and the best. And then trying to go back to work. <sighs> well, that's that's kind of what's next. How did you try to do it all mm -hmm. as it pertains to body image? How are you working through that? Yeah, I I wish that I, I could be like oh, I just think this and I do that and I say these mantras and then I feel better and I feel good. And I almost could tear up right now because it is an area of my life where I I can't give any advice on it. I don't have any um, tricks or tips or things that have worked yet. And I'm low-key embarrassed because I'm the kind of woman and the kind of feminist and the kind of, you know, champion of women in all the ways, in all the beautiful ways God has made us. And so I, the Christina in a book or in a magazine or in an interview with anybody other than you would be like, you know, I've just decided that I don't want to look like I didn't have a baby because I did. And I, I want to say that like, I want my body to show the, what it's been through and how it housed two humans. And those are all things that like, yeah, I think about in my head, like, those are nice thoughts. That's a, that's a catchy thing to say. How, how festive and cute to be able to be like, I am so grateful that I look at these look stretch, at this stretch marks. marks and look at this like saggy belly button skin, how it shows that my body, and it's true. But the more overarching thought is, is that, oh, I hate this. Like was the first time. My body had changed a lot in sort of its like composition, but pounds wise, that went away rather quickly. I just was breastfeeding and I walked a lot and bang, bang, boom. I was back yes. to my pre-pregnancy yeah. weight. This time? Oh, no, 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 no. It, 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 it has taken forever. And this time, last time I went back to work quickly, but this time I went back to work on a show, two beauty shows. So the first time I went back to a Navy show and I was in a big old Navy uniform. This time I was six weeks postpartum. And and playing a 26-year-old TV exec who wears cute little leather skirts and blazers. And then playing what was a blessing in a way that I didn't expect. Being able to play Condola, who herself had just had a baby. Um, 
and bringing my baby body to work was both a big blessing, but also difficult in a way that I thought was only going to be good. So like I say to other people, I'm like, oh, how great that like I got to bring my saggy boobs and my, you know, hanging belly to work and it was appropriate, perfectly appropriate for the character. But also I think that we don't see that on TV normally. And so I wasn't prepared for how authentic it would look, but also how different from what we normally see of women who've just had a baby on TV. Because normally they go to the hospital, they have the baby, they leave their bellies flat again, they come back home. They, I mean, they look exactly like they did before they had a baby. Yeah. So I think we weren't used to sort of an authentic portrayal of what a body looks like after that. And so I wasn't prepared for the tweets and things that were like, why does Contola still look pregnant? Um, or, oh, there was one. And and I and that is when I decided not to be on Twitter. Um, one, and these these are not mean-spirited tweets. Yeah. They're, they're true questions. Yeah. But there was one that was like, uh-uh. Because someone wrote back, oh, well, she just had a baby in real life. And they were like, oh, well, I need to get a trainer now because I'm not trying to uh, two to three months later still look pregnant. And I, Oh, Christina, I didn't even know that. I just deleted the app off my phone. I was like, oh, no, I don't need to see this. Oh, <laughs> this. And wow. it's totally, and I'm not even saying this defensively. It's fine. Like, it's a genuine question. Why does that actor look like she actually had a baby? Well, she did. Yeah, we don't see it. Yeah, we, we don't see, see it. point. Yeah, um, wow. But I am still, I am st- I'm back at my pre-pregnancy weight, but my body will never be the same. Mm-hmm. And I am still figuring out ways to honor that, to love that, and to to have positive things to say about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not there. Well, I I mean, I struggle, you know, Mm -hmm. with body image. And I have not yet had a baby. So there's also something interesting that's going on with my um, thinking surrounding pregnancy because... I have the fears already. Mm -hmm. And so just as a woman, I'm really trying to find better practices now. That's so smart. To to make peace with the body I have now. Ooh, that was good. So who that was, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear what you said because I feel like we're gonna be such better people walking out of this. I I feel better already. I'm like I feel great about my mind, my path, my body. I'm feeling oh, really good. So what has been your takeaway from our conversation? Um, so I think my biggest takeaway has been that it is time to honor where God has us right now. Right now is good enough. We are good enough. Our work is good enough. Our bodies are good enough. This stage in our our life is good enough. And if God thought it fit for us to be right here right now, why would I tell him he's wrong? And I I took from you and from this that I am um, I'm gonna stop telling him he's wrong. <laughs> because and, and stop the talk, the negative self-talk in every aspect of my life. Um, and I'm going to hold you accountable and I'm going to really, really, really lean on you to hold me accountable because, um, I feel great right now, yeah. but call me in an hour. So <laughs> we'll have a breakdown later tonight. Yeah. Later tonight. I'm yeah. sure it's fine, but at least we have, we're mindful of the accountability. Yeah. We're mindful. Yes. And I think that's what we do. That's just what we do. Yeah. My takeaway is, um, to be more mindful about the things that come out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. Period. Just. That's it. And we'll it yeah. And especially, you know, now having this platform, you know, I'm now being more open and vulnerable than I ever have before with way more people than I ever mm-hmm. had before. And so I need to be mindful about what comes out of my mouth, but also I just want to have even more belief in myself. I want to believe in, I want to believe in myself as much as I believe in you. That's what I want. That's my takeaway. I believe in you. I can't, it's going to make me cry. I believe in you so much, Christina. There's nothing you can't do to me. There's nothing. 
There's nothing in the world that if you set your mind to do that you can't do because I've seen you do the impossible. I've seen you do it. Even just giving birth to your sons, I've seen you do it. I've seen you push through hurt and sadness and still stand tall. And so if I believe that you can do anything, then I have to believe that I can too. We were doing so well. We literally had not had one tear. (laughs) But it's true. Like if I, I have to see myself in you. The same way I think of my beautiful feathers in. Well, sis. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for having me. This was the best podcast I've ever... I mean, it's. I got to just hang out with my best friend. After the credits, Christina tells us about the person she believes everybody should learn about in elementary school. Stay with us. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a production of OWN and LWC Studios. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Lauren Francis and Shanice Tindall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. So you studied African-American studies in college at Harvard. <laughs> I don't know why you would say it that way. <laughs> so who's someone you learned about for the first time in college? Mm, okay. And it impacted you the most. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that this person necessarily impacted me the most, but I feel like it's a story that I was so surprised I didn't know about until college because it's the kind of story that you should be teaching elementary school students about and they should be doing projects around because it's not just that this man um, was a great figure of Black history, but he did something so innovative and cool and courageous. So Henry Box Brown mailed himself to freedom. What? In a box? Mailed himself from the South to the North? That's where the box comes from? Yes, because he was in that box. Yes. Wow. And that is a story that, yes, impactful in my life. Amazing. But also, I tell my kids about, like... I've never heard this story. And I went to Howard and studied all sorts of African-American study classes. A simple, like, interesting tidbit about someone who had a courage to do a very strange thing that worked. Yeah, Henry Bucks Brown. Mm -hmm.